Welcome to the inaugural episode of Responsible Impact. This show is a production of Magic Links, and in each episode we'll do a deep dive across all manner of things environmental and e-commerce. In environmental terms, we know it's not feasible to reach exactly zero impact, and so we're striving to be as responsible about our impact as we can. In this episode, I spoke with Jonah Bush. He's made his life's work out of climate change and the value of forests, and if what he's proposing is implemented, the way we buy goods could become part of the way we fight climate change. To kick things off, though, here's his quick introduction to ice cream as economics. Economics is the study of choices that people make when they can't have everything. So let's say you go to the ice cream store and you're deciding, should I have a chocolate or a vanilla ice cream? And probably in the moment, you're just making that decision based on which one uh, will taste better. But there are farmers in Ghana and Madagascar who are anxiously awaiting your decision. Because if you buy a chocolate ice cream, that means you're going to spend money that goes to an ice cream company, that goes to a farmer in Ghana for the chocolate. And if you buy the vanilla ice cream, that money goes to the farmer in Madagascar who grew the vanilla. Decisions like these, millions of them, get made all over the world every day on what to buy or what to do with your land or many other decisions. And these millions of individual choices get made through markets, and that's what economists study. So basically, long study short, I study chocolate. Not only is Jonah an economist, he's an environmental economist that has some pretty specific things that go along with it. So an environmental economist studies the choices that people make that interact with the environment. And these come in two big categories. We take resources out of the environment. You know, we, we mine gold or we log forests and we put pollution into the environment. The trash that we make goes into landfills or the plastic into the oceans or the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we have a name for pollution. We call it externalities, meaning something that is harming, usually it's harming someone else who's not involved in the decision to, to buy something. I'm going to jump in to give a quick breakdown. So when he says externalities, the reason they think of them as external is because they're not the immediate transaction that's happening. So when I buy ice cream, for instance, I might think that the deal is just between me and the ice cream vendor. In reality, there's fossil fuels that were burned, there's packaging, there's materials that might end up as pollution or as waste. There's all sorts of things that are external to that immediate deal, but are still part of the equation. And in this case, he's talking about externalities that contribute to climate change or are just outright pollution. So when you're buying that chocolate ice cream again, you're helping that farmer in Ghana, uh, but you're also affecting other people. You're affecting everybody who breathes air and who likes to have a, a cool, uh, not warmed planet. And the reason for that is the, the chocolate might get cleared from, uh, on, might get grown on lands that was cleared from forest. And so if you have chocolate farms instead of forest, you have less carbon on the ground, you have more carbon in the atmosphere where it's causing global warming. Lucky for us, it turns out economists have a term for this rebalancing of the scales. Economists have an, uh, an idea for how to correct that problem. Our jargony word is called internalizing the externality. In case you need to hear that one more time, it's internalizing the externality, which is a mouthful. When you're buying that ice cream, again, you're sending a signal to the farmer in Ghana that you value the chocolate that they're growing. But we would like to have a way that you can also tell the same farmer that you value the trees that are there because you probably value the chocolate and you value the trees. But right now you're only sending a signal that you value the chocolate through the money that you spend. So in a nutshell, what Jonah and his colleagues are trying to do is make the forest worth as much to the people who have the land by being a forest as it could be by being something else. Because the contribution that the forest makes to the rest of the world in terms of keeping our climate stable is as valuable to us as almost anything else they could put there, if not more so. 
So this brings up a couple questions for me, and I'd like to kind of segue into them for a hot second, if that's okay. So one mm-hmm. is I want to make sure that I have the right understanding. A policy is the rule. So like if I'm playing mm-hmm. Monopoly and somebody changes the rules, they've changed the policies. And that's mm-hmm. so it's basically just another way of saying we would have to change the rules around this so that we can encourage the kind of gameplay we want to see. Is that a fair way to think of policies? Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So so the yeah. Let me maybe be uh specific about some of the sorts of policies that are out there that have been very helpful in addressing the issue of tropical deforestation. Look at Brazil. Brazil had the highest rates of deforestation of any country in the world uh, for, for several decades leading up to 2004. And because of that, they were also one of the largest contributors to climate change. And then in 2004, they had a, a government that changed their policy towards the rainforest from encouraging clearing it to encouraging preserving it. They put in a bunch of protected areas, national parks, essentially, saying on these public lands, it's no longer permissible to cut down forests and clear it. They also recognized the territorial claims of a lot of the indigenous people that were living in the Amazon rainforest and were doing so with with minimal destruction of the forest. On private lands, there were laws for a long time that only allowed a certain amount of clearing, but not a larger amount. And those laws hadn't been followed. But then with the help of satellite monitoring and environmental police, they started enforcing those forest laws. And one last example of that was included, the soy and the beef industries of Brazil who were the big contributors to clearing the forest, voluntarily decided if you are a farmer and you clear forests to grow soy and beef, you can no longer sell those products through our association. And all of these policies put together worked and the rate of deforestation fell by 80% from its high in in 2004 to to a low in 2012. That was that was a great success story over that nearly a decade Brazil went from being an environmental villain to being an environmental hero. If like me you wanted to bust out the champagne and celebrate, hang tight because since 2012 those policies are being undone and the success is being reversed by successive administrations in Brazil and then much more quickly uh, unwound by the current administration in in Brazil. And yeah. that is that is wrapped up with a, a disrespect or a denial of science, for sure. You know, in, in the Brazilian government, the same sort of denial of climate change that, that we've seen, particularly in the in the U.S., spreading there as well. Oh, boy. So when I think about cycles, there's a carbon cycle yeah. that, that, that scientists know about. Carbon in the land is there in, in trees. Trees store carbon in their trunks, in their roots, branches, and so forth. Um, there's also carbon, of course, stored in fossil fuels, the oil and gas that accumulate mostly from trees and other living things that died a long time ago. And and the cycle is that when we burn those things or when the trees die naturally, the carbon goes up, it combines with oxygen and goes into the atmosphere and, and forms carbon dioxide. The right amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a good thing. It's what keeps Earth at a nice, warm, habitable temperature. But with too much carbon dioxide, you trap the heat that comes in, more heat comes in than goes out. And so the Earth gets hotter and hotter beyond the point that humans have adapted to and our agriculture has adapted to and the other species here have adapted to. So it's a problem. When there's balance, the natural ecosystems, the ocean, the land, the forests would be taking out as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as is going up. But right now we're out of balance. We're sending way more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than the trees and oceans are, are taking out of the atmosphere. We're, we're doing that by burning fossil fuels. We're doing that by burning forests, especially in the tropics. Um, but that's a correctable problem. And the way economists think we can correct that problem essentially is to make it more expensive to, uh, to burn carbon and to make it uh, profitable or to make it to have payments 
for taking carbon out of the atmosphere by having more forests. What are some things that you're like, man, if people could only see this and this, they would understand why I've made this my life's work, like why this is important. Like, what are those what are those things? Or if you had to tell a five-year-old, like, you know, this is why my work is important, what would you say? So I think for a five-year-old, maybe I'd just say forests are are important and we should have more of them. But, you know, as, 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 as kids get older, I might start to add to that, you know, why are forests important? Because they're home to lots of plants and animals, certainly, but they also help people in lots of different ways. So forests keep our air clean. They keep our water clean so that we're healthier. Uh, forests keep our, our climate cool uh, so that our planet stays a nice place to live. Uh, th- that's the climate aspect. I mean, now, of course, with COVID, uh, there's another really important reason to keep forests intact, prevent diseases from jumping from forest animals to people. You know, I, I'm, I'm recording this from home today. Your home, everybody who's listening is probably at home. And and the reason is we have this global disease outbreak that started from an organism that that used to live in animals in in the forest. And and this is not the first time that's happened. So HIV started from a a disease that jumped from forest animals to people along along with a a lot of other diseases. Um, And the more people uh, clear forests, the more they become uh, exposed or their their livestock become exposed to animals in the forest and, and pathogens or, or viruses that can make that jump. So that's another reason yeah. to keep forest standing. I think um, that that touches on a concept called biodiversity, right? And um, mm-hmm. And so biodiversity meaning that there are so many different kinds of species. It's like when you, ha- if you have a lawn and your lawn is just, you know, a uh, Bermuda grass, that's mm-hmm. really kind of a monoculture. There's one kind of thing growing there. And then biodiversity would be if you had a natural lawn and different seeds had come in and taken root over time and you have really a ton of different kinds of things there. Well, so like if a disease came through that really loved to eat, you know, your your grass, it would probably wipe out your lawn very quickly. But any one disease that landed on, let's say, your like natural straw grass that happened to be dropped by some bird a couple years ago, it might not move on to the other flowers and trees and things that you had in that same space. And that's a really good idea or a good example of how biodiversity sort of keeps things at bay. It keeps them from becoming sort of wildfires in that way, in a communicable way. Um, mm-hmm. And so when you talk about biodiversity is destroyed, of course, as forests are logged and just cleared and you know burnt or any number of things happen to them. How long does it take for biodiversity to recover? You know, in, in some places, nature starts to come back very quickly, but it, it may not reach what it was before for decades or even centuries. And you make really good points about the importance of biodiversity or just the diversity, the breadth of the millions of other plants and animals that we share this planet with. But there, there's more of them in some places than others. So the closer you get to the equator, the more p- different types of plants and animals you have. There's two places that stand out even within the tropics for having the most number of species. And those are in the ocean, the coral reefs, and on land, the tropical forests. You know, w- w- within a single square kilometer of tropical forest, somewhere like Ecuador, you could have thousands of different tree species, more than in many countries uh, in the northern latitudes. I, I'd mentioned before how, how when viruses jump to people from animals, it's a big health problem. It can also be a big health solution. People who've lived in the forest for a long time know about the medicinal properties of many of the plants or, or animals. Uh, and many of our you know, most important medicines have come originally from from tropical forest species. Cancer treatments, malaria preventing drugs, birth controls, some of the most widely used have all come from plants that were first in the rainforest. We lose those forests at our own peril. I'm gonna just repeat that. We lose those forests at our own peril. All right, moving on. A lot of these are nations that we don't think of as developed nations. A lot of them are developing. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of economic incentive. There's a lot of reasons people might individually feel like, if I want to get ahead in life, if I want to send my kids to college, I'm going to cut that forest down and I'm going to raise cattle on that land and I'm going to have the money to make my life better, 
right? Um, mm -hmm. what what's the right framework for fully understanding that there's this economic hand that's pushing people towards deforestation? And what's the right way to come at it from countries like the U.S., where despite our own recent economic flexes, we're still broadly a developed first world nation and we don't have the same economic pushes to just to deforest and things like this. How can we discuss it without sounding almost um, colonial or condescending or like, well, they just they didn't get the value. So they made a poor choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important question. And I do want to point out that the U.S. did have much more forests than we had now. But in uh, the past century or two, we cleared our forests. And it's, it's only in very recent uh, three decades or so that we've started regrowing the forests more than we've cut it down. And, and Europe did that even before, uh, before we did. What people are doing in the, in the tropics is not different than what we did here. It's just happening now in real time. Um, and it's really important that when people in the US or in Europe ask people in Brazil or Indonesia to protect forests, that they're doing so in a respectful way. And I mean that in a very specific way, which is re respect that one, the, the people of those countries have the right to do with their land, just as we've done with our land. And that if we want to ask them to protect forests, that we be willing to put money behind that request. So it's not telling them, don't cut forests, cutting forests is bad. Rather, it's saying we value all of the good things that those forests provide, and we're willing to pay for them. I wonder, I, I, the thing that immediately comes to mind is there are a number of places in America where people feel like the economy has certainly forgotten them. And that's, those are discussions that are very nuanced and are, would re really, frankly, be a whole other <laughs> episode. Um, but I think to those people to hear that perhaps some of their tax dollars were going towards asking someone in a nation very far away to preserve something there for the sake of climate change, which they may or may not even accept is, is happening, that seems probably like kind of like a highway robbery, if I look at it through that lens. And what should folks who have that reaction or that perspective, what should they know or how should they be reframing this to see more clearly? Like, what should we say to those folks? I would start by pointing out that climate change is a global problem. It does affect everybody. It even affects people who don't believe in it. And it affects us certainly here in the United States and California, where, where we live through more wildfires, through shrinking coastlines, droughts, all these things that, that affect us. And so to fix this global problem, we need a global solution. And there are benefits you know, to stopping climate change everywhere. So if you have fewer coal plants running here in the U.S., then you have fewer air pollution deaths downwind of those coal plants. So that's a big benefit. But there are benefits in, in other countries, too. If you have more forests, you have less climate change, but you also have cleaner water, you have more plants and animals, you have cleaner air and so forth. The crux of it would be that a country along the tropics is not very far away from, say, Nebraska, not from a climate perspective. Those are really their neighbors. We're, we are certainly connected. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this also touches on some issues of globalization. I think the idea of our responsibility, again, to people who are far away and why we need to be worried about that. And I know we can see this in our oceans, for instance, right? So there are pieces of litter and garbage that have entered the oceans in places I will never probably set foot in my life. When I walk on the beach nearest me, I might, after a couple of years, come across that same piece of litter. The climate and the bigger forces at play in our world connect me to these faraway places and to these otherwise strangers, right? So the kind of idea that we need to act on this global scale, especially in a time when nationalistic fervor is being used so effectively to turn out the vote for certain candidates and to really draw lines for who belongs where and why, in an economic sense, is there something that you guys look at and you're like, again, <laughs> it's okay. It's better to think on a global scale than on a tribal or a national or a local scale. Um, sure. So the, I'd say the classic 
example within economics is is trade. Um, so if if you can if you trade only within your neighborhood, you're going to be less well off than if you can trade within your state or within your whole country or within the whole world. So the, the more you're able to buy that chocolate again from Ghana, the happier you are than if you can only get flavors that grow in your neighborhood. Which if you you know live in I have no chocolate country, in my neighborhood. There's no, so. there's no, no chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's right. And of course, there are, you know, there's winners and losers from trade or, or from making trade too open with no rules, no doubt. But overall, you, you can make people happier by trading, uh, which is why so much of it has always happened. With the environment, it's something similar. With environmental problems, the world can solve climate change much more effectively and cheaply if we're all working together than if we're each working independently. When it comes mm -hmm. to the environment and climate change, I know everybody talks about like trees, trees, trees. What does a tree, I mean, it's not out there with elbow grease and rubber gloves actually, you know, and it's not up there holding up an air purifier, catching the dirty air as it goes by. Like what is a tree doing that's actually helping the air and helping the planet? You know, I think it, you're joking, but you are actually right. I mean, trees are wonderful air purifiers. They do take toxins out of the air and lock them away. But when it comes to climate, what they're doing is they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and locking it away. Trees photosynthesize as they grow. They turn carbon dioxide from the air plus sunlight into carbon that's stored in their trunks and their roots and their branches. And the more the trees grow, the more carbon dioxide they take out of the atmosphere. So the more trees you have and can keep alive, the less carbon dioxide you have in the, in the sky. And it sounds like trees in tropical latitudes, are, are they better, you would say, at doing this than trees in other areas? Or They are. And there's a few reasons for that. One is just that forests in the tropics grow to be larger generally than forests in other regions. They grow taller and they have more carbon there, hectare per hectare, than, than in other places. Another thing that's great about forests in the tropics is, we, we touched on this earlier, but they have many, many more plants and animals, different species that live there than at high latitudes. So if you're interested in biodiversity, the tropical forests and the tropical coral reefs are really the world's treasure houses. And so when we talk about the double down problem of losing trees and how this is really not a good thing, it's, and you mentioned it earlier, but I want to make sure I have the right understanding. So not only is it because the tree was using that carbon to grow, mm -hmm. but I've taken all the carbon that it held just in its body as a tree, so to speak, and I've stopped that process, right? Like I've released back, that all back out by using it, most often by burning it. But the things that it was going to continue, the carbon it was going to continue to capture from the air and take out of, you know, of the warming cycle, is that the right way to say it? Yeah. That its future ability to help safeguard against climate change by pulling carbon from the air is now also taken out. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. You're burning the candle at both ends, Ooh, as it were. Not, not you're again. burning the trees, so you're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And because those trees are no longer there, you're taking less carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It even gets a little bit worse than that when you think that most of the time what's replacing those forests is cattle pastures or agriculture that's emitting carbon dioxide as well. That's, a, that's what I euphemistically call a bad bad. Is what that sounds like. A, a bad bad, yes. A bad bad. <laughs> that's probably that's probably what I should have said to the five year old. The yeah, <laughs> deforestation is a bad bad. Like, I mean, obviously, before twenty twenty became the year that broke everyone's expectations everywhere. Brazil's fires and Australia's fires. Like, what do fires like this mean for your work? What do they mean for climate change? What's mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I, I want to point out there's a big difference between the fires in Brazil and the fires in Australia or California, mm -hmm. which is that in one type of forests, in the in the Australian or Californian forests, um, many of them are meant to burn. They've evolved for uh, millions of years before people were even around to have fire. The trees 
um, are adapted to fire or in some cases even need fire. So fire is, it's a natural part of what's supposed to happen in those places. Not all the forests, but many of them. In contrast, in Brazil and in Indonesia and in the tropic, fire is not a part of natural rainforest ecosystem. They may go hundreds or thousands of years uh, without burning naturally. And so the fires are extremely disruptive. They, they kill trees. They don't grow back. They're a big issue because most of the places in Brazil are where forests are burned, what's happening is, is deliberate. It's not a runaway forest fire that's caused by lightning or a stray cigarette or something. It's a deliberate use of the fire to get rid of the trees to intentionally put in a cattle pasture or a, a soy field. As we mentioned, the, the, that has a big impact on the climate because the carbon that was in the forests is now in the atmosphere. Uh, you mentioned satellite images and things earlier. So satellite imagery and technology, how has that shifted your work in the last few years? So satellite imagery has been revolutionary. In 2013, for the very first time, there was a map published in the academic journal Science that showed everywhere in the world where forests had been cleared every year at the size of a baseball diamond. And there had been absolutely nothing like it beforehand. We sort of went from the, the Stone Age to the Computer Age overnight. And you know, this was a big team effort. Basically, this was coming from a satellite that the U.S. had launched, a satellite program since the 70s called Landsat. And then an act of Congress said that all the, the information that it had would be made free to the public instead of charging as previously. And then, you know, the big data people at Google and elsewhere processed the data. And a professor at Maryland named Matt Hansen drew it all together, figured out what was deforestation or not, and, and published this scientific article. We can watch as forests are being lost everywhere in the world. And we can see them growing back too, although they're not growing back as much as they're being burned and, and cut down and cleared. This is really revolutionary for a number of reasons. One of them is just direct law enforcement. As I'd mentioned, Brazil had had for a long time laws about how much forests you could clear on a private property, but they didn't enforce them, in part because they, they hadn't really been able to. The other thing satellite imagery has allowed Jonah and his colleagues to do is to compile data that really conclusively shows what the core drivers of deforestation are. Turns out, there's a handful. Through a meta-analysis, through looking at hundreds and hundreds of published studies, my colleague Khalifi Ferretti Gallen and I have come up with six things that generally make deforestation faster or slower. Two things that generally accelerate deforestation are agriculture, as we've talked about, and roads. So if you put roads into a forest region, that's going to follow with people coming in along those roads and clearing forests. And then the four things that consistently slow down deforestation are protected areas, so national parks or forest reserves, payments, directly paying people to keep forests standing on their land, uh, enforcing forest laws, and empowering indigenous peoples. You know, we saw with Brazil, almost all of their policies touched all of these six factors, and, and satellites helped to do that. Another key point Jonah made was that, contrary to what you might intuit, it's actually not the poorest people who are responsible for the most deforestation. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting things that, that Khalifi and I found in our study is that more often than not, it was the richer places in a, within a country or within a region where more deforestation was happening. That's not to say that there aren't poor people who are clearing forests. There certainly are. But more often than not, as people or, or households, villages, states get richer, they clear forests more. Part of the reason for that is that it's expensive to clear forests. You have to have machinery. You have to hire people. If you're, if you're poor, you don't have that ability. So when people talk about, and I know we touched on this earlier in terms of like how can developed nations speak to the economic incentives that are driving this behavior? I mean, when we, when we talk about bigger, broader things that people may not think are related to the environment, like the economic 
relationship that we have with another nation, it sounds to me like there's actually a very, very quick relationship. It may not be A to B. It might be A to B to C. But when we talk about things like tariffs and import exports and like different goods that are and are not allowed to move through countries, and when we think about deals that we structure that are mutually beneficial versus ones that maybe maybe we leave the other guy hanging a little bit, it sounds like all of this kind of creates a broader economic world that somebody living in might be like, well, if that door is closed to me, but I can clear this land and make this money this way, that's the, that's the door that's left open to me. Right. Like, is that is that a fair kind of connection to make to say that like bigger global international trade issues actually help inform the climate, so to speak, that encourages this behavior? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you're an individual person, you know, you or I or, or a, you know, a farmer in, in Ghana or Brazil, you know, our individual ability to to set global trade rules is, is you know, essentially zero. Um, yeah, nothing. But we just respond to that. And basically, the way we feel the impacts of those is through, uh, through prices. What does it cost us in the store to buy chocolate or to buy beef? Or if you're growing those things, how much money can you get by growing beef or by growing chocolate? Through our national governments, those institutions have power to set the the rules of international trade or to set, you know, to set taxes, tariffs on that trade and, and, and change the prices on, uh, and then you can change what you can pay for. So as I mentioned right now, you know, you, you, if you want beef, you can go out and, and buy a hamburger, but if you want, uh, you know, tropical forests, there's not really any way you can go to the, to the market and, and, and just buy more, but through national policies, there could be. In his book, Why Forests, Why Now?, Jonah and his colleague laid out a case. They said that if you took the emissions from deforestation around the world every year and lumped it together like a country, it would be even larger than the European Union. So, naturally, I asked him to elaborate on that some. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be the third largest uh, country in terms of emissions, you know, if, if tropical forests were their own country. Uh, behind China, behind the United States, but as you said, ahead of the European Union. Um, And the reason is, I I think most folks aren't aware just how much carbon there is in a tropical forest. Look out your window at a tree. Just think of how much that tree weighs. Oh my gosh. Half of that tree (laughs) Half of that tree is carbon. No um, way. Almost exactly 50% of the weight of that tree is carbon. Uh, and then now multiply that tree by, you know, think of a forest. Think of just one square mile, how many trees there are there and how many pounds of carbon there are in that, that tree. Um, many is my guess. Many, many. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That, that's a, the, about as good a scientific term as I could give to many uh, pounds of carbon. And then you know, if you were to burn one square mile of forest in the tropics and all of that carbon goes up to the atmosphere, the amount of carbon dioxide from that is extraordinary. You would have to drive your typical American car in your driveway to the sun and back twice no. to release that much carbon dioxide. Yeah. And, and, and it's not just one square mile. It's an area of tropical forest about the size of Maine that gets burned down every year. So when you multiply all those trees, uh, you know, a main sized area of trees, you're, you're talking about big countries worth of carbon emission. By now, I was sort of starting to scratch my head, wondering exactly where deforestation ranked up against, say, oh, I don't know, fossil fuels being burned. Yeah, I mean, it's big. Tropical deforestation is the second biggest cause of climate change. So the first one by far by far is burning fossil fuels. That's about two thirds of, uh, of the climate problem. So it's the biggest, but it's not the only thing contributing to climate change. The second, around 10% of the problem comes from burning tropical forests. Another note from your, from your book was that an analysis of, was it 2002 to 2009 data was revealing that forests cleared to produce only four commodities and in only eight countries made up a third of all emissions from tropical deforestation. And that really made me wonder, like, which commodities was it being cleared for and which countries? And, you know, the solutions to this, it, it really is just paying to keep the forests there? 
Yeah, so in terms of the commodities, the big ones are cattle, soy, palm oil, and wood and paper products. And it's it's and in terms of the countries, the biggest two for the last two decades have been uh, Brazil and Indonesia. The third one is the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and some of the other big ones are you know, Malaysia, Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, and there's others going down the list. But a lot of tropical deforestation, most of it is going to be going toward beef and soy in, in South America, going toward palm oil and timber in Southeast Asia, specific commodities in specific places that are uh, you know, the focus of the problem. The industrial associations or the trade groups that, that deal with these commodities, I mean, what do they have to say about the fact that their activities in these nations are responsible for such an outsized burden on the rest of the globe? So in 2010, a lot of the big traders and buyers of these commodities made a pledge to cut their deforestation in half by 2020 and to end it by 2030. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Here we are in 2020. Not a, not a single one of the hundreds of companies that took this pledge can show that they've, that they've met that target. You know, they said the right things for sure, but um, we, we haven't seen that translate into real uh, reductions in deforestation yet. Deforestation is still going up. And you, you asked the question a little bit earlier about, is it only about paying countries to keep forests standing? I mean, I, I do think that that has to be a really big part of the solution. For part of the reasons we talked about, it's about respect, but it's not the only part of the solution. There's There are groups now that are also focused on cleaning up these supply chains, getting deforestation out of the supply chains, you know, holding companies accountable for you know, growing their produce, their crops, not in forests. And, and that's a big part of it as well. What can I do when people are bad actors in this way that actually makes a difference from, from the point of view of me who has like other responsibilities and a job and I have to keep the lights on in my own life? You know, what can I do that's within my reach that would actively help? Yeah, so I guess for, first, first the question about, you know, what, what can I do about companies? And then second, you know, what can I do positively in my own life? What's this? So, so you know, in terms of companies, we as individuals um, hold, you know, only a little bit of sway to the extent that we choose who to buy from or not as, as consumers. But, um, you know, companies are regulated by our government. And so, you know, we can ask our government to be uh, in, enforcing policies to get, to get companies to take deforestation out of their supply chain. Um, and in some sense, it'd be better for the companies as well. It'd be a level playing field if there was one rule they all had to follow to grow their, their beef and soy not in forest areas. And it'd be better for them than if right now, you know, some of the good actors are voluntarily saying, we're not going to grow uh, beef in these places, but they're undercut by, by their competitors who, who do. And so, you know, in Brazil, it was actually the entire industry association that said, we're not going to uh, buy beef or buy soy from deforested places. So, you know, I think when, when it comes to holding companies accountable, we, we kind of do that as citizens in a democracy through our through our government and its policies. You know, you asked what are, what are things that everyday people can do in their life to um, to to protect forests, to to solve climate change. Um, you know, there's 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 one thing that really stands out to me, um, and then that's eating less beef. So even it's not even uh, you know fully becoming vegetarian, but but cows, the way they're grown, have a really outsized impact on the climate, uh, including through clearing forests in, in South America to to you know to make way for pastures. There's and, a rancher somewhere listening to that Aaron Copeland song Rodeo, who's like who's not very pleased to hear this right now, but go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but 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 there's uh other there's other ranchers who are gonna be growing 
their their beef not at the expense of forests, and and so they're going to be better off. I, I guess you're talking about individual actions. There there is a limit to individual actions. You know what I'd like to see overall is is that the cost of climate change gets included through a you know a carbon price that's included in the price we pay, whether it's for beef or for oil or all these things, and then the ranchers who can grow their beef not at the expense of forests would be at an advantage because they could they could sell more cheaply they could keep more of the profit and the ones that are growing their beef at the expense of forests that price would be included in their in what they sell so so they would have a disadvantage in the market so. do you think that part of what would be needed is better transparency in labeling because i i know that like right now if i go to try to find beef that was grown in a way that didn't come at the expense of a forest there would not be anything on the label that would tell me that you know i wouldn't know where it was from i wouldn't i might not even know which country the beef was from it might be mm-hmm. buried in some sort of you know cryptic barcode or something is one step towards helping solve this also the ability to empower consumers by having better labeling laws and, and enforcing those i think it wouldn't hurt um you know it, it wouldn't hurt to to make you know it help consumers vote with their dollars as you're saying but it also puts the burden for knowing quite a bit onto the consumer. I mean, why, why should you have to know everything about where uh, your food is com- coming from and the effects that it's having? Uh, you know, it'd be much simpler mm. if you could to just have the cost of the damage to the climate be reflected in the price. And then you would just know that if a product is harming people through climate damage, it would be more expensive. When I think about things that I've heard lobbyists come back with, throughout the years, it's always that, you know, like, well, if we make our product more expensive, um, people who are sort of socioeconomically disadvantaged are going to lose out. And how can you make this policy that discriminates against them? Um, and I also know, though, that when you take the the full picture, look at what we're talking about happening here, that people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged are already the ones bearing the higher cost of climate change right now. Is that a strong enough argument, you think, to companies who would want to retort that, like, oh, well, we can't raise our prices. We can't possibly take on this cost and this responsibility. That's not our fault. You know, we're not in the business of keeping forests. We're in the business of getting beef to your plate, for instance. Um, yeah. What do, you, what do you say to that? Yeah, so, so it is really important. I mean, who, who, who bears the costs and who gets the benefit of um, policies for climate, including uh, prices on carbon? And what I point to is that if you put a tax on carbon emissions, as you say, that falls on some people harder than others. It falls on poor people generally harder because they're the ones spending more of their money on buying carbon intensive things. But the other half of the story is having raised all that money, how do you spend it? Uh, And you can spend it in a way that is pro-poor, that makes people living in the poorer communities better off. Um, So here in California, there has been for several years a very active cap and trade program that makes uh, that that makes carbon pollution, climate pollution expensive, a little more expensive than it would be um, because companies have to buy permits um, in order to pollute, which they didn't have to before and they don't have to elsewhere. And that, uh, in addition to helping California bring down its climate emissions. It also raises money for California. And California, by law, has to spend at least a quarter of those proceeds within communities that are that are designated as being poor or disadvantaged. And so that makes sure that the money gets recycled to those to those places. This has been such a really enriching talk for me. And I'm so grateful to you for taking the time and being willing to do this. Uh, is there anything else that you would really like to touch on today? Um, well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. To, to, to sum sure. it all up, I yeah. would say we need to have a lot more climate action than we're seeing currently you know, in this country and in the world. Uh, and that means having less burning of fossil fuels. And it also means having less burning of rainforests. The respectful way to do that, as we've talked about, is to back up our wish for more forests 
with the ability to pay for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Yeah, thank you. For more about Jonah's work, follow him on Twitter at Jonah Bush, J-O-N-A-H-B-U-S-C-H, where you can also find his book, Why Forests, Why Now? This is only our first episode, but let us know what you think or what you'd like to see featured. Write us at info at magiclinks.com. Also, I'm pretty sure each podcast needs some credits or something, so here are mine. Major thanks to Sarah Anderson, Dylan LaBelle, Chloe Castiglione, Michael Sadorf, Hazel Shin, Brian Nickerson, of course, Jonah Bush, and you for listening. I'm Natalie, and I'm out. Till next time, gang.